Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right. I see. Oh, my goodness. Some waving happening. Um, and welcome back. I see some folks are back. All right. Um, and happy Monday, everyone. So joining me today is NSC Coordinator for Strategic Communications, John Kirby. We know there's a lot moving today, uh, so Kirby will provide updates on security assistance uh, for Ukraine, the grain exports coming out of Odessa, and other foreign policy news of the day. Uh, he'll be with us for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, end his portion and then get to uh, the other parts of the briefing, and I'll take some questions after that. Everybody okay? Everybody settled back there? All right. Kirby, it's all yours. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Just a few things at the, a few things at the top. Uh, today, I think you're tracking the first ship successfully left the port of Odessa in Ukraine under this recent deal between the United Nations, Turkey, Ukraine, and, and Russia. Uh, we obviously welcome this important step, and we hope to see more ships depart in the coming days to travel onward to world markets with agricultural products such as grain, wheat, sunflower, oil and corn. The ship left today had something like 20, 26,000 tons of corn. Russia has, of course, weaponized food and uh, has effectively blockaded Ukraine's ports since the beginning of this crisis. And we urge Russia to meet its commitments under this new arrangement, including by facilitating unimpeded exports of agricultural products from Black Sea ports in order to ease the food insecurity around the world. So we're going to be watching it closely. Also on Ukraine today, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, the Secretary of State Tony Blinken, uh, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, spoke together with their Ukrainian counterparts about the enduring U.S. support to Ukraine as the Ukrainian people continue to stand up to Russian aggression, and to inform them about a new $550 million security assistance package that the Biden administration will authorize today. Uh, this follows Secretary Austin's call with his Ukrainian counterpart on Friday where he previewed that package. Today's announcement is going to include more ammunition for the High Mobility Advanced Rocket Systems, otherwise known as HIMARS. I know you all are familiar with that, as well as ammunition uh, for the 155 millimeter artillery systems, which have already been uh, uh, supplied to Ukraine and are in the field. Uh, this will be the 17th now time that the Biden administration has authorized a security assistance package using presidential drawdown authority since President Biden took office, and it brings to more than $8 billion drawdown authority uh, alone uh, in material and security assistance for Ukraine just since the in uh, invasion began in late February. Now on Taiwan, because I know that's on uh, everybody's mind today, I want to reaffirm that the speaker has not confirmed any travel plans, and it is for the speaker to do so and her staff. So we won't be commenting or speculating about um, the, the stops on her trip. We have been clear from the very beginning that she will make her own decisions and that Congress is an independent branch of government. Our Constitution embeds a separation of powers. This is well known to the PRC, given our more than four decades of diplomatic relations. The Speaker has the right to visit Taiwan, and the Speaker of the House has visited Taiwan before, without incident, as have many members of Congress, including this year. Now, the world has seen the United States government be very clear that nothing has changed, nothing has changed about our One China policy, which is, of course, guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint U.S.-PRC communiques, and the six assurances. We have said, and we have repeatedly said, that we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. We have said that we do not support Taiwan independence, and we have said that we expect cross-strait differences to be resolved by peaceful means. We have communicated this directly to the PRC at the highest levels, including as recently as last week in the phone call between President Biden and President Xi. The National Security Advisor, the Secretaries of State and Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff have also made this very clear to Beijing in a half a dozen recent high-level conversations. Put simply, there is no reason for Beijing to turn a potential visit consistent with long-standing U.S. policy into some sort of crisis or conflict. 
or use it as a pretext to increase aggressive military activity in or around the Taiwan Strait. And yet, over the weekend, even before Speaker Pelosi arrived in the region, China conducted a live fire exercise. China appears to be positioning itself to potentially take further steps in the coming days and perhaps over longer time horizons. Now, these potential steps from China could include military provocations, such as firing missiles in the Taiwan Strait or around Taiwan, operations that break historical norms, such as large-scale air entry into Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone, ADIS, I think you all know that acronym, air or naval activities that cross the median line, and military exercises that could be highly publicized. This could also include actions in the diplomatic and economic space, such as further spurious legal claims by Beijing's public assertions last month, or I'm sorry, like Beijing's uh, public assertions last month that the Taiwan Strait is not an international waterway. Some of these actions would continue concerning trend lines uh, that we've seen in recent years, but some could be of a different scope and scale. The last time Beijing fired missiles into the Taiwan Strait was 1995 and 1996, after Beijing reacted provocatively to Taiwan's president's visit uh, to deliver an address at his alma mater. I want to contrast this now between the United States and China. We, and countries around the world, believe escalation serves no one. Beijing's actions could have unintended consequences that only serve to increase tensions. Meanwhile, our actions are not threatening, and they break no new ground. Nothing about this potential visit, potential visit, which, oh, by the way, has precedent, would change the status quo. And the world should reject any PRC effort to use it to do so. We will not take the bait or engage in saber rattling. At the same time, we will not be intimidated. We will keep operating in the seas and the skies of the Western Pacific as we have for decades. We will continue to support cross-strait peace and stability, support Taiwan, of course, defend a free and open Indo-Pacific, and we're still going to seek to maintain lines of communication with Beijing. All of that is important, and all of that, all of it, is preserving the status quo. We expect to see Beijing continue to use inflammatory rhetoric and disinformation in the coming days. The United States, by contrast, will act with transparency. We'll stand up here, we'll answer your questions, we'll give you the facts. We are also committed to keeping open lines of communication with Beijing, as I said. This is what the world expects of not just the United States, but of China. And we encourage Beijing to keep that commitment as well. With that, go to some questions. Thanks, John. So given all the saber rattling that's being done by China and the fact that Speaker Pelosi is still considering a trip, the fact that you're laying out all the possible reactions that China could have, should we take this as a, a sort of test of China's willingness to make good on some of its designs on Taiwan or a, a test of whether they've learned some of the lessons that, uh, that Russia learned by Ukraine, uh, invading Ukraine? The short answer to your question, and then I promise I won't just leave it with a short answer, is that's a, that's a better question for President Xi um, and what's in his mind uh, over this. I think we've laid out very clearly that if she goes, if she goes, it's not without precedent. It's not new. It doesn't change anything. I mean, it, what we would hope they infer from everything we've done and everything we've said, including during the president's phone call, is that we're being consistent. There's no change. We, we've not ramped up the rhetoric. We've not changed our behavior. Everything we've done is consistent with our obligations and our commitments. But if the policy hasn't changed, then why was the speaker being urged not to go? I don't know that she was urged not to go. Who urged president, her not to go? The president said on August 20th that the military doesn't think it's a good idea for her to the go. The speaker makes her own decisions. What we did was provide her context, analysis, facts, information, so that she could make the best decision uh, possible for every stop, for every overseas travel. And again, I'm not going to get ahead of her or her staff here with respect to the rest of this trip. Does the U.S. military still think it's not a good idea? I would refer you to the, the, the military. Again, 
we as a national security team, not just DOD, we are obligated and we take it, that obligation seriously to make sure she has all the context she needs before she travels overseas, and, and, and we did that. And oh, by the way, we'll continue to do that throughout the re remainder of her trip uh, for, for anything else that she needs uh, to make sure she has a successful visit. Okay. John, uh, thank you. You've been emphasizing the separation of powers and the separation of the legislative branch from yeah. the executive. Does the White House feel confident that President Xi understands that separation? As I said in my opening statement, uh, we, we've had, you know, diplomatic and bilateral uh, uh, relations with the PRC for decades. They understand well. I can't speak for President Xi, I wouldn't do that, but our assumption is they understand very well how our Constitution is organized and that there are three equal branches of government. It, you know, I don't think I'm hearing you say yes to that question. Am, am I? I said it in my opening statement that, pr that, that, that the, the PRC understands well the separation of powers. Um, if, if you are confident about that, was this an issue that President Biden raised directly with President Xi during their phone call? We didn't get a very detailed readout of the detailed yeah. discussions they had during that phone call last week. The president, in his conversation with uh, President Xi, uh, made clear that Congress is an independent branch of, of government and that Speaker Pelosi makes her own decisions, as other members of Congress do, about their overseas travel. That was made clear. Can I just do one more follow-up? If, if the policy is that the President wouldn't encourage or discourage a lawmaker from traveling to a specific place because of the separation, if a senior lawmaker were to plan a trip right now to, say, North Korea or Moscow, would we not hear the president weigh in in those instances? I think you would see the president be consistent. Uh, we provide members of Congress facts, analysis, context. They make their own decisions about where and when they're going to travel. Um, we do the best we can to provide advice and counsel and context and information, and that will continue. There's nothing inconsistent about that at all. I just realized I have my badge on. I got to take this off. Uh, has anyone in the administration uh, or in this White House explicitly spoken with the Speaker and said you should not go on the trip? I know the President has not done that, but has there been any communication from senior national security officials inside this White House? There, the there have been direct conversations with the Speaker and her staff before she left uh, at various levels uh, in the national security uh, establishment. Uh, the President did not. Uh, speak directly with the speaker about this trip. Um, I am not going to divulge the contents of those conversations that we have, I mean, with her, particularly with the speaker. I will just go back to what I said before, Tyler. Fulsome discussions, context, analysis, facts, information uh, about her overseas travel, which is completely consistent with the way we do it in the past. It seems like this trip obviously is sparking a little bit more anxiety inside this building and throughout the administration. And I understand that you said the president respects the independence, but given the national security risks at play and China's escalating rhetoric, was there not a discussion inside this administration about whether or not you should take a more urgent stance, as, as MJ just alluded to, if there were other countries at play here, we might see a different response. Given what China has said it might do in response to a trip, that puts all Americans at risk in their national security. Did the president feel that maybe this is a different case, that he should be more involved or his team should be more involved than yeah. he might be? I mean, again, I'm not going to get into the details of the conversation. Uh, they, they were comprehensive discussions about, uh, about what she wanted to achieve on this trip, where she wanted to go, um, and we provided her the same set of context and information that, that we have in the past with respect to her overseas travel. I'm not going to get into the details of that. Um, in the back. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, why did the president bother with this drama from the beginning? I mean, why not, rather than saying the military doesn't think it's a good idea to go, why not call the Chinese bluff or, or tell them to pound sand when they started bellyaching about the possibility of this trip, given, as you pointed out, there's no change in policy and there's precedent for Pelosi to visit Taiwan. So what's the drama? What? what? Have okay. you watched the previous last couple of weeks? I mean, there's been this question of Yeah, I've been here the last couple of weeks. I haven't seen any drama. I think, I think you're manufacturing it with your question. Look, we have been nothing but clear um, with the Chinese uh, about 
where we stand on the issues and the one China policy and our support for a free and Indo, uh, free and open Indo Pacific. Look, I want to go back to what I said at the, at the beginning because, and I hope you took note. Nothing has changed. There's no drama to talk to. It is not without precedent for a Speaker of the House to go to Taiwan if she goes, and I'm not confirming that she is. And it's certainly not without precedent for members of Congress to, to travel to Taiwan. It, it has been done this year, and I'm certain that it will be done in the future. Um, we have no interest, as I said in my opening statement, uh, increasing tensions here. We have no interest in changing any of the approach uh, approach that we take uh, as a government uh, or in keeping with our allies and partners to uh, to wanting to see uh, cross straight tensions be resolved peacefully without a unilateral change so I don't know about the drama that you your 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 claiming exists um, it's quite the contrary here uh, and the point that we have made uh, I made it again today and President Biden made it with President Xi is Everything here is consistent. There's no reason to use a potential visit to, 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 uh, to justify or to spark some sort of crisis or conflict. Uh, we certainly aren't, have no interest in that. And there's no justification to, to use a potential visit as a pretext to conduct what could be escalatory measures, such as the ones I detailed in the opening statement. You keep saying that the speaker um, has a right to make her own decision, and another speaker visited before, which I believe you talked about Gentrich when he visited in 97. Right. But it's different timing, there's more tension, and the speaker represents the president's party. So while she has the right to make her own decision, why can we say that the White House disagree with her decision? Because that will cause more tension. You can just say that categorically now that she basically um, the White House disagree with her visit? I'm sorry, but you're asking me why I can't just say we disagree with the visit? Correct, because it might, for all the conversation we're just having now, it would cause yeah. more tension. All right, so two things. One, there's been no discussion by the, the speaker about what's next on her trip. So you're, you're asking me a question as if she's already somehow confirmed that she's going to Taiwan. I haven't seen any such confirmation. And again, I would point you to uh, the, the speaker and her staff uh, to talk about her uh, her itinerary. Um, and number two, again, our responsibility is to make sure that she and her team have all the information they need. And we keep that line of communication throughout a, a trip, as we should. Of course, it's a, it's a requirement. Um, but the speaker and her staff who advises her, they make the decision. So um, you, you guys for uh, anybody to be at risk here with a, uh, a potential visit. Again, hasn't been uh, announced, and I won't speak uh, for uh, Speaker Pelosi. But there's certainly no reason for this to come to blows. There's certainly no reason for this to, to escalate. Um, um, and as for the potential risks, um, I think that is a better question put to the PRC um, and to the PLA Army and Navy and the Air Force. Um, we're going to watch this very, very closely. We're going to make sure that she has a safe and secure visit because that's our responsibility. Um, and we urge, as I said at the outset, we urge China to, if she goes, to see this for exactly what it is. Nothing new, no change to our policy, and certainly not an unprecedented uh, visit by the Speaker of the House. You also said the U.S. will not be intimidated. Do you feel that using language like that right now will be viewed by China in a, in a way that you are also raising rhetoric the way they have? You said it right at the top, like, that they have. Uh, they have been out there uh, in, in recent days uh, with some irresponsible rhetoric. Um, we feel it's important for, for everybody in the region to understand how seriously we take our security commitments in the Indo-Pacific, and that's why we put it that way. Uh, there's no reason, Jeff, for this to, to, honestly, there's just no reason for this to escalate. Um, and uh, in fact, there's there's every reason, given the our national security interests, as well as the interests of our allies and partners that, 
that are at stake in the Indo-Pacific on any given day, there's every reason for this uh, to, to not escalate um, and for the lines of communication to, to remain open between Washington and Beijing, and that's what we'd like to see happen. Russia, one on Iran. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, does the White House currently know whether Speaker Pelosi is planning to go to Taiwan? I realize she's not announced anything publicly. You've also said White House officials have been talking to the Speaker's uh, staff. So does the White House currently have knowledge whether she is planning to go to Taiwan? I am not going to talk about the Speaker's itinerary. I'm just not going to do that. And Jeff, I want to go back to one other thing, if I may, because it was in my mind and I flew out of my mind as I was answering your question. Is, when you talk about or you th threaten uh, these kinds of potential operations, military operations and exercises and missile launches that I talked about, I mean, what, what that does is it does increase the risk of miscalculation, as I said, and which could lead to unintended consequences. And, and that's really the risk. You're, you asked specifically, are they at risk? That's where the risk comes in. It's, it's not so much uh, that there might be a direct attack but it raises the stakes of miscalculation and confusion, which could also lead to unintended consequences. Okay, Darlene, and then I'm going to take some in the back. Okay, now. Okay, stuff, given everything that you've laid out here, why do you think China is reacting the way it is reacting to this speaker and this trip? It's, it's difficult to know specifically, and, and you're kind of asking me to get inside their brains, and I don't know that I'm comfortable doing that. I, uh, I think, again, that's a a question better put to President Xi and, uh, uh, and, and the PRC and their, and their military leaders. Um, there has been, you, you've heard Chairman Milley talk about this um, even before we were talking about a potential visit by the Speaker, of increasing uh, aggressiveness by PLA military forces uh, in the region alone, um, uh, violations uh, uh, in air and sea space across the strait, um, uh, more uh, aggressive uh, and proximate military exercises, um, and of course, in their rhetoric. I mean, this has been going on now for months, and if you really want to, you can go back years in terms of uh, Chinese uh, coercion and uh, intimidation uh, tactics, even just in the military environment um, in the South China Sea, East China Sea. So been building. Um, I, I can't account for why they have answered the, just the possibility of this visit in the, in the manner in which they've done. I can only account for President Biden and for this administration and for how we are trying uh, to manage tensions and quite frankly, manage this one of the most consequential bilateral relationships in the world. And that is by making it clear what we're seeing, sharing it with you, uh, making it clear that there's no reason, for whatever the reason is, there's no reason that it should spark some kind of conflict or that it should precipitate increased tensions or uh, serve as some sort of pretext uh, for some sort of what they would consider a, a, a reaction. If the speaker goes completely consistent with what's been done in the past, and certainly not at all a statement about any change to American policy with respect to one China and, and to, and to cross-strait tensions, and quite frankly, to our obligations under the law to continue to support Taiwan's self-defense. Okay, I'm going to if she does go to Taiwan, how will the White House find out about it? Will, will she call someone in the NATSEC team? Will you see it on television? How will you know? Well, look, uh, the, the speaker's flying aboard a military aircraft, so <laughs> we'll know. Okay. All right, we're just going to do two in the back, and then we got to wrap it up. Go ahead, SB. Admiral, uh, you talk about the separation of, of, of the Congress and, and the White House and the, and the executive branch, but when she takes a military aircraft, how then do you, which is under the control of the president, how do you make the case that, well, we had nothing to do with this at all? I didn't say we had nothing to do with this at all. No, we've never said that at all. We, <laughs> from the time she informed us that she was going to go overseas, we put the gears in motion like we always do, and that is to provide military transportation. Nothing new about that. Provide her team, 
with information, context. You've heard me, you've heard Kareem talk about that. Nothing new about that. I mean, uh, it's not that we're not involved, but we don't make the decision for the speaker. She makes her own decisions. We give her advice and counsel and context. She makes her own decisions. And the president, uh, having long served in the Senate himself, he understands and respects uh, the institutional prerogatives of, of members of Congress. All right, last Bonnie question. Ron. All the way in the back. The thanks, Kareem. Oh, thanks, Kareem. Um, I have a quick question about the Iranian-American dissident journalist, Masi um, Alina Jad. During an interview on CNN this morning, she called on the Biden administration to expel Iranian diplomats contending the regime has now twice challenged the U.S. government on U.S. soil, alluding to the kidnap plot um, last year and then the arrest last week of a man near her home with a loaded rifle. Is that something that the White House is even considering or if there are other diplomatic levers the president is prepared to pull? There's, uh, there's somewhat of a l limit to what we can say on that, so let me just lay it out for you. We, the United States condemns the apparent attempt to harm leading Iranian activist and U.S. citizen Masiya Linjad at her home in New York last week. We commend law enforcement's swift and effective response to this apparent threat to her. Um, this is an open criminal investigation, and so I'm going to refer you to law enforcement for any further comment. While we wait to see the results of that investigation, uh, we do want to reaffirm um, that it is a first priority for the Biden administration to counter the threat posed by Iran, including uh, against dissidents that are living in the United States and current and former U.S. government officials. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, John. All right. Just have one thing at the top, gas prices. Um, just to provide you all uh, an update on where we are currently uh, with gas prices, uh, we have now been falling for almost seven straight weeks. Uh, as of this morning, gas prices have dropped 81 cents per gallon since their peak in June, as you'll see from the chart uh, to my left here. Uh, that means American families who, who, with two cars are saving $80 a month. Uh, drivers can now find gas for $3.99 uh, or less uh, at around half of all gas stations across the country, and average gasoline prices have come below $3.99 in 19 states. Putin's war is still putting pressure on global oil supply, but President Biden is taking historic action to mitigate its impacts on American families. He is releasing one million barrels of oil a day from the Strategic Petroleum uh, Reserve, which is a historic uh, action that he's taken. He rallied global partners to release millions of barrels of oil, and under President Biden, U.S. oil production is up and track and on track to reach a record high. The Treasury Department estimates that the historic release of oil by President Biden and international partners has reduced gas prices by up to about 40 cents per gallon, as we have shared with you all last week. Uh, more work remains, but the fact is that we are currently experiencing the fastest decline in gas prices in over a decade. And with that, Darlene. Uh, thanks, Karine. A couple of questions about the president and uh, his latest bout with COVID. Um, the first time he tested positive, the White House had identified 17 contacts. Can you update us on those? And then were there any additional contacts from him testing positive again yeah. over the weekend that we should be aware of? So those 17 are uh, continue to, to test negative. So that's the update on the, the first uh, positive test that the president had that we shared with all of you. Uh, uh, with this positive test that we uh, saw and shared with all of you again on Saturday, there's been seven, I mean, not seven, I apologize, six uh, close contacts. And those, uh, those six individuals uh, continue to test negative. Has he resumed the blood thinning medication that he had stopped when he was on by COVID? Uh, he has resumed uh, all the medication that he was on, the medication that he was on before. And then one final question quickly. There was video of him yesterday FaceTiming with the folks, the veterans camping out on Capitol Hill. We haven't seen anything from him today. Can you give us a sense of how he's doing um, with having to go back into isolation? I mean, is he you know, frustrated? Uh, 
and, and how is he dealing with yeah. being away from the First Lady for as long as he's been? Well, the day's still young. You never know. Uh, okay. um, but um, look, the President. I'm <laughs> just, just making a joke. Clearly, it was not funny. Uh, I will try harder next time to be more funny. Um, but um, uh, look, he is continuing to work from the residence. Uh, and I just want to share, uh, as we all know, the president is fully vaccinated. He's fully, uh, he's double boosted. He was on treatment for Paxlovid. And, um, and, and because of that treatment, he had very mild symptoms. And we had said with Paxlovid, there would be a small percentage of, uh, of folks do have a relapse. This is what we saw. Uh, but he's doing well. You, you saw him, as you said, Darlene, uh, and he said he's fine. He sounded great. Uh, and uh, he's looking, as we know, he is, he's someone who likes to be out there with the American people. He's looking forward to being out there uh, again. And um, uh, yeah, but he's going to continue. It doesn't stop him from doing his job and doing the work of the American people. So he is uh, in, in the White House residence, and he's going to continue to do that uh, as he uh, isolates for a couple more days. Thanks. A couple of clarification points on that. Uh, Dr. O'Connor said today that the president's feeling fine, um, but he didn't mention symptoms. Can you clarify on whether he's even experiencing any minor symptoms, congestion, where are we on that? So he is not experiencing, we haven't seen any reoccurring symptoms. That was in uh, Dr. O'Connor's uh, letter on Saturday, so that continues to be true. I spoke to Dr. O'Connor uh, not too long before coming out uh, to, to talk to all of you. As you know, some of you have had COVID, some of you have loved ones and close Close, close friends who have had COVID, those symptoms that you have don't don't go away right away. They kind of linger. Those minimal uh, symptoms kind of linger for some time. Uh, so you could expect that. Uh, and so uh, with that, but there's no no reoccurring symptoms. He's he's actually he's feeling fine. The uh, CDC guidelines on the so-called Paxlovid rebound are a little unclear. Can you clarify on what the expectation is of how long the president will? continue to isolate? Is it uh, five days after the rebound positive? Is it, are we looking at another sort of clear set the clock and 10 days out from the rebound positive? What's the, the guidance on that? So he's going to abide by CDC recommendations. So it would be five days five as days. far as the isolation. From Thursday, from the, oh, the, 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 the rebound. The rebound, right, okay. on Saturday, Sorry. yes. COVID you're about to get, you're about, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going um, back and forth there. And then, um, uh, did, did, were you able to get a sense of the president's reaction to Senator Manchin uh, yesterday repeatedly <laughs> refusing to get behind an endorsement for a re-election? Um, and does the president, if you did get a reaction to that, uh, feel like members of his own party are undermining him on that front? I, I mean, I, you know, I saw those interviews. Uh, I, I wouldn't say he was undermine. I, it, from what it looked like to me, sen uh, pre Senator Manchin is very much focused. Uh, he went on. He went on the uh, the shows to to focus on the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. He was very. He was zeroed in on that and laid out uh, why this is going to be a benefit for middle class families and why it's going to lower costs and why it is an investment, a historic investment, uh, in 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 uh, you know that we have not seen in a long time, whether it's climate change. Or, uh, or just in, in general, as we try to reduce inflation and fight that back, and you and figure out how do we continue to lower the deficit. And, and so, repeatedly asked whether he would support President Biden in a 2024 re-election, and he repeatedly refused but here's, to Okay, go there. so here's here's what I say. I'll say about this. And you know, we from from the podium, I really cannot dive into any election. Uh, but I've been really clear, and the president has been asked this question many times, and he intends uh, to run in 2024. He plans to run in 2024. That is way off like we are we are a long ways away uh, from 2024 and here's the thing our biggest thing right now is to not be distracted uh, you saw chips uh, pass last week which is going to be a huge investment in manufacturing and in, in low in uh, really strengthening the supply chain we we're just talking about national security so we'll strengthen our national security a huge deal and now what we we still have a few things uh, ahead of us uh, that's going to be really important to get that done uh, for for the American people People. So we're going to stay focused, and so we're not going to be distracted, and that's that's how we see things at this time. Gotcha. Uh, thanks, Green. A follow-up on the COVID uh, topic. Is it possible that the president, in his understandable desire to show that he was able to work through his first bout of COVID, 
pushed himself too hard. And that is partially what led to this coming again. I mean, any body, be it 79 or 46, has to rest when you get this. No. Uh, <laughs> just to answer that very... Um, so look, you know, uh, we, were, we were transparent that we were aware that when it comes to Paxlovid, that there is a small chance, right? There's a small chance of relapse. Uh, it is not uncommon. Uh, it does happen. And here's the thing, the, the president, according to his doctor, had very mild symptoms. Uh, and so we don't think that, he, he, you know, he overexerted himself or was the right, wrong decision. Uh, it, was, uh, it was because of how he was doing uh, at the time. And so, again, we were transparent about what we thought could potentially happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we also were transparent that if he were to test uh, positive again or have, or have that relapse, he would share it, which we did. And, uh, and now he's feeling fine. Uh, he's doing well. He's doing the business of the American people in the White House residence, and he's looking forward to, to, to be out here again. And on one other topic, um, what's the next step from the White House's perspective on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act? Do you and have you had any signals from Sen uh, Senator Sinema as to whether or not she will support it? So I'm. I'm not going to get into details about any conversations that we're having with uh, congressional members. Uh, I will say, and I've said this before, our White House staff, uh, White House officials here continue to be in touch uh, with folks uh, in the House and offering any technical assistance, offering um, any guidance that folks might need there. So we'll continue to do that. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll leave uh, it to Senator Manchin, who spoke to that and was, again, was asked uh, many questions about uh, Senator Sinema. So I'll leave it to him in that conversation as the, the negotiations, negotiations are, are occurring. I, I wanted to ask about New York City declaring a public health emergency as it relates to monkey talks over the weekend. Does the administration generally support local municipalities taking this kind of action as they see fit, that these are their own decisions to make? I, we see that as their own decisions to make. Uh, clearly, it's a local jurisdiction. It's for them to, to figure out what's going on in their own community. They know best uh, of what's happening on the ground, so we leave that to them. Uh, I do want to I do want to add so because we do have some news on on um, the vaccinations that I've mentioned uh, the Janos vaccination that were that was announced uh, last week on Thursday 737,000 vaccines are out uh, as as I'm speaking in front of you right now they're being shipped uh, to uh, to areas that really need to to areas that really need them and so if you think about the 737,000 7, 7, 7, 7, uh, and the 300,000 plus that we have put out that puts 1.1 million uh, doses that's out in the United States and so that matters it's very important as, as we're trying to really have a uh, aggressive approach uh, to dealing with monkeypox on testing. And I don't know if folks had this, but we are doing testing about 80,000 tests per week. Uh, and that's another important, significant way of making sure that people are getting tested so they know uh, uh, if they have monkeypox or not. And lastly, and I've talked about this from here already, which is the education, which is the outreach, uh, educating uh, uh, public health officials and activists out there, making sure that uh, they know exactly what to look for and what the treatment is. Uh, and so that as well continues. Do you have any insight on the president's own thinking right now on the possibility of declaring a national public emergency on this? I know he'll obviously be advised by uh, folks around him, including Secretary Becerra. But what does he think? So when it comes to a public health emergency, uh, that is a decision that uh, that is made by uh, Secretary Becerra. That is not made uh, by the president. But as you know, we are considering every policy option uh, to help end this outbreak. Uh, that is uh, urgent and that is important to us. Uh, but again, that is up to uh, Secretary Becerra to make that decision. Any general timeline? I, I would I would uh, refer you to HHS on, on a specific timeline. Yes. Go ahead, Franco. I'm uh, you before. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just curious if there's any concern about the president's rebound case, uh, concern that that could set back any efforts to get people to take or 
for Paxlovid to be prescribed for severe cases? Well, absolutely not. Uh, the way we see it is uh, Paxlovid has over 90% chance of preventing severe illness if it's taken early. Um, and, you know, as we saw, the president had very mild symptoms uh, because of Paxlovid, because he was fully vaccinated, because he was double boosted. And so uh, we, we anticipated that. We had said there would be a minimal chance uh, of him having a, a relapse. And so, uh, you know, again, you know, the relapse uh, truly uh, is, is small and, and the protection of, of Paxlovid easily outweighs that uh, as we see it. Uh, and so, again, you know, we encourage uh, Americans out there who haven't uh, fully get, gotten vaccinated to do that, who haven't been boosted, to go ahead and get their booster. The treatment that the president uh, received is the same treatment that others uh, could receive as well, and that is because of the work uh, that this administration, that this president has done from day one and in walking into uh, the White House. Also, what about Russia and, banning that Jewish agency? Also, if I could ask, I know uh, you're, you're a little tired of t asking about 20 or answering questions about 2024. Oh, never tired. And never President tired. Biden running, uh, whether he will run. I was just, you know, with, with former President Trump talking about submitting his paperwork uh, pot potentially before the midterms, why, when will President Biden file his paperwork? And wouldn't that help kind of nip some of these questions in the bud? I mean, the president has said that he intends to run. He's, he's said that multiple times. Uh, so there's that. I'll put that out there. Uh, but again, we are we have some you know we have some work to do uh, in the next couple of days and weeks that we're going to focus on. We're not going to be distracted uh, by what's happening uh, with the former president. That is not our focus. Uh, our focus right now is you know as we're talking about the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, which is which is historic, as I just laid out, which is incredibly important as we talk about uh, lowering cost uh, prescription drugs for our seniors, as we're talking about uh, getting some of that energy, lowering costs uh, on energy uh, for, for families who are sitting around their uh, kitchen table trying to figure out how are they going to uh, pay for whatever item that, that is incredibly important to them. Uh, so this is what this is going to do. And so we're going to continue to talk about that. Uh, we see that we see the uh, infl um, Inflation Reduction Act as a down payment, as a promise that uh, we, the president, has made, and uh, and so we're going to continue to make sure we get that over the fish finish line. Okay. Um, just a question about the president's COVID case uh, and, and guidelines. You outlined that he'll be in isolation for five days. How does that relate to potential travel? I know that yeah. um, even if you test negative, there are CDC guidelines that discourage you from traveling for a certain period of time. Does that clock start back at zero with the rebound? Case? So the travel is is uh, a little bit uh, different because there 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 are no CDC recommendations on uh, regarding travel for rebound uh, so that does not exist in this for rebound cases uh, so as far as travel I just don't have anything to share with you, for you right now but right now CDC doesn't have any recommendations for 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 a rebound on so cases is the White House operating under the uh, assumption that when and if the president tests negative then he will both be cleared to return to work in the Oval office and travel wherever so we're gonna do the I just mentioned the isolation uh, five days He's clearly he's going to be testing uh, regularly. One of the reasons, right? One of the reasons that we were able uh, to share with you that he tested positive is because we upped his testing cadence uh, because of his unique role, right? As president, we wanted to make sure uh, that we were keeping an eye on that, and so that's why we were able to share uh, that testing, uh, his uh, his test, his him testing positive on sun, on Saturday. Uh, so we'll continue to do that. Uh, but as far as travel, there's just no uh, CDC recommendation. Once we have more, uh, uh, we will let you know. Perfect. So I'm just wondering, yeah. is the White House plan that as soon as he tests negative, he can ref he can return to all activities? There's no that's, that's that that is our hope. That is our expectation. But we are going to follow, as I just mentioned, uh, CDC guidance as it relates to isolation. And just one last one on the president's schedule. Last week, when before he tested negative, you guys gave us a more fulsome readout 
of what he was doing, yeah. um, what meetings he had. We've received nothing today. Can you give us some sort of, uh, is he on the phone with lawmakers, with his economic team, his COVID team? What is the president yeah. today? Again, the day is young. <laughs> but uh, so we, um, I, I know on Friday we provided his meetings, um, He, which included uh, dealing with the awful flooding in Kentucky and helping provide federal resources, working, working with Governor Bashir and uh, Senator McConnell, speaking with members of Congress and meeting with his senior staff. Uh, he will be doing a, a lot of that work virtually, as we have done in the past. Uh, and, uh, and so, I mean, the work doesn't stop. He'll just continue to do that. On what he's done today. Well, he'll be meeting with senior staff for sure. That is something that's pretty regular on his schedule. So I can for sure uh, share that with you. If there's anything else to read out, uh, we will be uh, we'll be share we'll share that with you. Go ahead. Thanks, Green. Is President Biden thinking about pulling his support for the Inflation Reduction Act? No. Because he promised it wasn't going to make. It wasn't going to raise taxes on anybody making less than $400,000 a year, but the Joint Committee on Taxation says that is not true. Well, that is incorrect. So the Joint Committee on Taxation, which you guys heralded as a, an effective body when you were selling the infrastructure package, is not to be trusted here. I said it is not correct because I will give you why it's not correct, because it is incomplete. Uh, the JCT uh, uh, report that we're currently seeing is incomplete because it omits uh, the actual benefits uh, that Americans would receive when it comes to pres prescription drugs, when it comes, comes to uh, the en lowering energy costs like utility bills. It does not include that. And uh, we have some experts, don't have to trust me, we have experts that say the exact same. Kimberly, Kimberly Clausing from UCLA, many key factors are left out in these tables, including, importantly, the effect of deficit reduction, the positive effects of the spending on clean energy, and the benefits from low drug prices, as I just stated. Seth Honlin, Center for American Progress. Republicans don't mention that JCT analysis includes an imputation of corporate taxes, i.e. the 15% minimum uh, on corporations with uh, less than $1 billion of profits to income groups, but does not include the major provisions that benefit people, including the tax cuts and uh, drug uh, savings, prescription drug space savings to be and specific. So Penn Wharton, where the president used to, uh, University of Pennsylvania used to be a professor there. Uh, the Penn Wharton budget model says this Inflation Reduction Act is actually going to increase inflation in 2024. Does the president worry about that? So we agree with Senator Manchin. You heard him a couple of times yesterday, and disagree with Penn Wharton as a as 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 do a number of qualified experts, which I'm happy to read out. But I, you know, I do want to say that it is uh, quite ironic. Uh, that uh, uh, congressional Republicans are complaining or, or uh, have a false, uh, a false outrage uh, on, on this Inflation Reduction Act uh, that is actually going to do something and help the American people lower cost uh, when, you know, when they have offered really nothing to do that. Uh, what they have offered is to increase taxes on Americans making less than $100,000 a year. And what they have uh, introduced is actually sunsetting Medicare and sunsetting uh, also um, uh, Social Security after five years. And that's how they want to uh, deal with uh, the how to help the American people. We are talking about doing the complete absolute complete opposite. And just one more. Uh, it's been three days now since a Chinese official publicly threatened to murder Speaker Pelosi. Where is the president coming out to respond to, at the very least, say, don't do that? Well, first, we've talked. Kirby was just here talking about how um, I have not seen those reports, so I'm uh, just going to say. They were going to maybe shoot down her plane, or that they would, oh. it would be within their rights to okay. shoot down her plane. All right. Well, we have talked about that. We have said that there's no need for this type of saber rattling. It is unnecessary. Uh, the president has been very clear. There's been no change uh, in the uh, One China policy. Uh, we continue to support the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, what we are seeing uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, what we're talking about right now, and to be clear, uh, the speaker has not confirmed, as you heard from my colleague just moments ago, uh, that she is going to Taiwan. It has not been confirmed. Uh, and, uh, you know, the history of this, of congressional members going to Taiwan, is not 
uncommon. It is something that has happened in the past. Uh, and, uh, and so, again, nothing has changed, and uh, the President has made that very, very clear. Just two more bits of pushback on the Inflation Reduction Act. The oh, sure. Right, farm is running ads in this town and probably others that says that uh, the uh, pay for when it comes to Medicare and allowing Medicare to negotiate some prescription drugs will result in uh, money coming out of the Medicare system and uh, the, the research and development perhaps being crimped. Uh, there's also the National Association of Manufacturers, which says that the uh, pay for the 15% minimum corporate tax is essentially a tax on domestic manufacturing because it would uh, in some ways target the uh, accelerated depreciation that many factory owners use to pay for equipment. Um, does the president, is the president confident that the, the, if, if passed and enacted, the bill will neither affect the Medicare program and the way the drugs are developed in this country, or uh, his goal is to increase domestic manufacturing? So I'll say this. There are 55 companies, corporations in this country who make tens of billions of dollars who aren't paying zero, who are paying zero. Uh, dollars when it comes to taxes. So this bill is going to fix that tax loophole and make the tax code fairer, and that matters. And when you think about what that's going to do, you think about that $300 billion that's going to go uh, towards uh, deficit, making sure that we continue to bring down uh, the deficit, $1.7 trillion we saw from last year, add another $300 billion. That is going to save cost. That's going to save cost for the American people. And that is so critical, so important, especially as we're talking about inflation and high costs right now. Uh, and so as it relates to the Medicare, just want to just say, like, the. AARP, who you all know, an advocacy group for seniors, has endorsed uh, this piece of piece of legislation. Uh, while the limit of costs of medicines and cap out of pocket expenses to two thousand a year for people on Medicare, it will limit that, which is so important uh, for many seniors. This will also strengthen Medicare by reducing its expenses, which save tax taxpayers money and helps fight inflation. And so that is uh, really important. These are the things uh, if you ask a family and you say to them, what are some of the costs that you want us uh, to bring down? What are the things that really hit your pocketbook? They will say prescription drugs. Many will say one of those things are prescription drugs. And so this is a historic investment that's going to make, that's going to just be a game changer for families uh, that is incredibly important. And that's what the president cares about. And that's how the president wants to continue to support this legislation. Just one question about the president's uh, COVID case. Given the importance of getting him back on a regular schedule, was there any discussion here about taking any additional steps to try to help him clear the virus faster and putting him back on Paxlovid? Uh, giving him more fluids, letting him sleep more, anything like that. Uh, I don't have anything more than what the what what his physician shared uh, today, and also the last couple of days to all of you. How his how he's feeling? He's feeling very fine. He's doing great. We heard from him directly say that, um, and we expected again. We expected with Paxlovid to be a relapse. It's not unusual. It's common. We shared that with all of you the last couple of days uh, during his uh, during his 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 uh, bout with COVID, uh, and so it. Again, this is not unusual. He's feeling fine. Uh, we will continue to share uh, an update from his physician. Uh, you'll get one tomorrow. And, uh, and so we're just going to continue with what the doctor lays out and takes his, take his word for it. Okay. Uh, what about the president sign the CHIPS bill? Is that something that he'll do while he's isolating? Is that something he's going to do when he can resume travel? Yeah, we will have something on that very, very soon. Okay. Don't have anything for you at this time. We will have something on that for you very soon. One more question. Has the U.S. received an official answer yet from Russia on um, its offer of a prisoner swap? So uh, we have uh, we've talked about this the, the last couple of days. Look, as you know, uh, we want to see Brittany Griner home. We want to see Paul Whelan home. They are wrongfully detained. We have been very clear about that. We put forward a substantial offer, uh, and uh, we you know we want to have a good faith uh, conversation on that. We want to uh, make sure that we get this done as soon as possible. Uh, what we have heard, uh, as uh, you've heard from my colleagues, is in bad faith. Uh, it is, uh, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's not a serious, there was a counter offer that was made, which we don't see it as a serious uh, counter offer. Uh, clearly, not going to negotiate from here, not going to get into uh, any specific details. Uh, but as you can see from uh, the substantial offer, as you can hear from Secretary Blinken, and as you've heard from uh, this president,
president, we are taking this very seriously, and this is a top of mind uh, for this president, and we want to see them come home. And the read about Russia? Uh, one more on the president's uh, case. You had uh, referred to the physician letter that says no reemergence of symptoms, but you also said lingering symptoms. So help us square that so we understand. Yeah, well, no reoccurring symptoms, uh, meaning like if you look at his original letter, there's nothing, um, uh, there's nothing like the severe, right? Because he feels fine, right? He feels he feels good. But as we know, when all of us have had COVID, you do have a, a little bit of a lingering cough, right? You do have a, a little bit of maybe a lingering uh, sniffles. That's not uncommon uh, to have. And so that's what we are talking about. So he is not 100% symptom free. He just didn't have like a fever return or something like that. Is well, that fair? Well, he never I had a, wanna... I want to be careful because we were we went into this about if he had a fever or not. He never had a, a fever. So I want to be really clear. Okay. His It was elevated, but it was never uh, a fever and I don't want to put but remember there were we had talked about a little fatigue we had talked about aches you know that he was he was there was a little bit of discomfort so that has not uh that has not occurred but all of us have had covid before right we've had well not all of us many of us i don't want to call everybody out uh i could speak for myself uh and there are some you know you still have a, a dry cough uh you still have you know little sniffles that that last for a little bit longer and you, 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 you saying he? Are you saying he or you? Yeah, I'm trying You're to get a sense of. I am saying that all of us have had COVID. Many of us have had COVID before, and they tend to be lingering symptoms, and that's what I'm talking about. So the president is still experiencing some things related to his COVID. Uh, course of illness. Right. And also, as we know, you all have known him for some time and covered him. He tends to have a dry cough. That is not unusual. So that is what I'm talking about. He tends to have a dry cough, which you all have heard before. So and just there, want to be clear on that, too. On he's working, he's calling and so forth. But to my knowledge, I don't believe you've talked about him getting extra rest or taking time away from work. Has he also had blocks of time where he's not doing anything so that he can rest? What I can tell you is that he has uh, been working eight plus hours a day. Uh, that is a schedule that he continues to keep. Instead of uh, doing it in the Oval Office, he's doing it in the, in the White House residence. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Green. Uh, the President suggested in Saudi Arabia that there could be an announcement on oil production coming. Um, with OPEC meeting this week, is the White House expecting an increase in oil production to be announced? Uh, I will leave that to OPEC Plus. Uh, we are not a member of OPEC Plus, as you know, and so I, I would leave them to answer that, uh, answer whatever they're going to uh, come uh, coming out of that meeting this week. But the president has received received no indication. He did make some strong comments when he was in Saudi Arabia about potential good news and consumers feeling relief. Again, I leave that to OPEC, OPEC Plus. Just a clarification on how we're counting the president's <laughs> days in terms of when he'll be out of isolation. Was Saturday day zero or uh, Saturday day one. So I, I believe we shared that on, 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 on Saturday. So what we shared is, is basically what it is. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll take one more question. I'll take one more question. I'm trying to try it. Right. Yep. Uh, so, I've called on you before. I'm, I'm going to call. <laughs> thanks, Green. Uh, voters in Kansas tomorrow will be the first in the country since the Supreme Court overturned uh, Roe v. Wade to have the opportunity to vote on an abortion-related ballot measure. Has the White House seen this as a vote that could have broader political significance heading into the midterms? So if it passes, uh, tomorrow's vote in Kansas could lead to another state eliminating the right to choose uh, and eviscerating access to health care. Uh, Republican governors and state legislators are imposing extreme laws, banning a woman's right to choose. Many don't allow exceptions even for rape or incest, and congressional Republicans are calling for a national ban on abortion. So President Biden has made this very, very clear uh, that the only way to secure women's rights uh, to choose is for Congress to restore the protections of Roe as federal law. So the majority of Americans, we, they support that as women's right uh, to choose. And again, Congress must act, as the President has said many times. And it is uh, also the American people uh, need to make sure that their voices are heard. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow.